Good evening. Welcome to the Grand Prairie City Council meeting for Monday, uh, February 25th, 2019. I'd ask everyone in attendance to rise and join us in singing O Canada. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, in all thy sons command, with glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Stand on God for thee. Thank you to the National Film Board for the images of our country and to our very own Grand Prairie Boys Choir alumni for the audio. Uh, we'll move into the adoption of our previous council meeting minutes. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Given. I'd move that uh, council approve the minutes of the City Council meeting held Monday, February 11th, 2019, as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Are there any errors or omissions that we need to change before we formally adopt them? I don't see anybody ringing in, and so I will call for the vote to adopt that set of minutes. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. And then we'll move on to the adoption of our agenda. Councillor O'Toole. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I recommend the council adopt the agenda as presented with two additions. They would come under 8.1, public member appointments for 2019, and 8.2, appointment of the city manager. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on the agenda as uh, amended with those uh, recommendations? Again, seeing nobody ringing in, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. That motion carries, uh, and that brings us to the delegation portion of our agenda. This is an opportunity that we have at every regular city council meeting for anybody in the community to come forward and address council on any community or municipal matter. Um, as long as it's not the subject of a public hearing, we do have two public hearings uh, on our agenda for this evening. So if you're here for those, you'll get an opportunity to speak uh, during the appropriate time when they come up. But if there's anybody else that came to address council on any municipal matter, uh, we'd welcome you to come to the front now. Um, and I don't see anybody rushing the stage, and that's okay. Uh, this opportunity does exist at every regular city council meeting, and we do always appreciate it if people let us know in advance that they intend to come, um, but it isn't required. Um, so with that, we'll close the delegation portion of our agenda, uh, and we'll move on into those public hearings that I mentioned, starting with item 6.1, the Land Use Bylaw Amendment C1260-103. I'd call this public hearing to order and look to administration for an introduction. All right, thank you, Mayor Given. Uh, the city has received an application to amend the Land Use Bylaw to change the designation of Lot 1, Plan 9232-3420 from Urban Reserve to a new direct control DC24 district. Uh, the site is located on the east side of the city and uh, is formerly the home of PARDS. Uh, the area is uh, located uh, uh, directly north of Eagle Estates. Uh, it is within the Fieldbrook outline plan, and, and uh, uh, Fieldbrook and Eagle Estates are obviously both residential areas. Um, the area is not serviced with municipal water or sewer at the time being, and in fact, the uh, Fieldbrook outline plan does not actually envision the servicing of those areas, and that has, um, has really... Um, influence the uh, the uh, the form of this direct control uh, DC 24 district um, the area is identified as residential in both the municipal de development plan and the Meadowview area structure plan uh, residential designation allows for and and, and contemplates uh, you know accessory functions such as recreation that really are 
uh, are part of a, of, a uh, of a residential neighborhood and en enhance the residential experience. Uh, and therefore, the uh, residential designations are consistent. Uh, the, uh, the Old Brook Outline Plan it does identify this area specifically as residential. Um, and uh, and therefore, this uh, the amendment to DC twenty four, which really accommodates indoor and outdoor recreation, is consistent with the field brook outline plan. Uh, we circulated this to adjacent property owners or surrounding property owners. We advertised this in the newspaper, and we had a sign posted on the site, all in accordance with the land use bylaw and the municipal government act. And we did not receive any comments or concerns uh, about this amendment. Uh, I should point out to the uh, to council that I believe that there are a couple uh, neighboring landowners who are here and uh, who may wish to speak on this amendment. Um, uh, the amendment uh, does this this DC 24 district that that has been proposed is very limited in the, the number of uses that are allowed and the intensity of the uses. And the reason for that is because uh, the area does not have piped water or sewer at this time and so the the intention of this district is to allow some development on the site in advance of piped water and sewer but keeping the intensity of this development quite low uh, because a greater density basically uh, should actually trigger outline plan amendments and amendments to all of the uh, design reports that accompany an outline, an outline plan. Uh, I should mention that in the bylaw and in attachment A, there are three references to the plan number being 992, starting with 992. In fact, the plan number starts 922. And so the council should, uh, I guess, uh, uh, adopt this bylaw as uh, amended. And um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, any questions for administration from council at this stage before we uh, open up to uh, presentations and submissions? Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Given. I've got two questions. One is, as I've visited facilities similar to this in other municipalities, there's often a clubhouse component where there's maybe a pub or something else like that in the facility. Uh, would that be allowed underneath these direct control rules or would this be just for volleyball? Uh, through the Mayor, under these regulations, it would just be volley volleyball. Uh, you know, in adding that sort of use uh, would require amendments to the land use bylaw, but this district would only allow uh, volleyball. And and not just, I mean, there's, the applicants are also proposing an indoor playground component under the indoor commercial recreation. Uh, but yeah, I, those sorts of things would not be uh, within this district. Thank you. Great. And if I may have one more question. And then my second question was concerning the outdoor volleyball. What, was there any consideration or any thought given to what noise impacts this might have on neighboring properties, especially in the evening during the long summer days? Um, through the mayor, the uh, certainly that that was a consideration in you know in I guess, determining what our what our recommendation on this would be. Uh, a outdoor recreation facility, as to a large extent, really is not substantially different than uh, a neighborhood park or community park. Although it's you know the the activities on the site are for. Uh, for a commercial use, uh, but uh, uh, a you know a bunch of people outside playing volleyball either in a municipal park or on a private lot, the impacts would be the same. And in a private park adjacent to a residential area would would in my opinion there would be no land use conflicts. So just because it's commercial, there are no different land use impacts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Gavin. Um, as I read through the report, I noticed the reference to um, the fact that access to the site, if it were to be approved, would be um, off 84th Street, but only temporarily, uh, because eventually 84th Street would be closed once 84th Avenue is extended. Um, I'm curious to know, it may not be relevant, and if, if it's not, say so. Um, I'm curious to know why it is that we're considering closure of 84th Street and and the need to have the uh, um, the property owner uh, make a change in their access. Uh, through the mayor, the um, 
Right now, 84th Avenue, which is directly north of the site, is not built, and therefore there's no 84th Street, 84th Avenue intersection. When 84th Avenue is constructed, there will be a new arterial to arterial intersection, and the access to this site is uh, inappropriately close to that intersection. And so the intention is, is that this site access, site access needs to move because uh, because of proximity to this future intersection. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you, but I, I understand according to the report that the that there would eventually be the closure of 84th Street. So is I don't understand why that would be. Uh, through the mayor, the, the, uh, it's the 84th Street access onto the site would close. 84th Street itself would not close. It's just the access onto 84th Street would close. Thanks, Mr. Welton. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, Mr. Welton, uh, just in regards to the site and its servicing through Aquaterra, currently it has none. Uh, we are requiring a stormwater study prior to the issuance of a development permit, but um, would the site require Aquaterra to service it? Um, through the mayor, the, the intention, there is, I believe, a, a well on the site, and, uh, and they provide the uh, sanitary through uh, septic fields. Uh, that is the intention, basically, moving forward with this low-scale development. I mean, that's, like I said earlier, that's one of the reasons why uh, the, the level of intensity that's allowed on the site is quite low, is, is because uh, water would need, to, would need to be provided by uh, the private wells at this time. Uh, as the area develops, more intensity occurs, uh, the expectation would be is, is that, you know, Aquaterra would tie in. Uh, the issue right now is, is that not only is the site not serviced, the Fieldbrook outline plan does not anticipate water and sanitary coming to this parcel. It kind of, it kind of diverts around it into the, re into the residential area. And therefore, as the site, in before the site intensifies uh, beyond what we think is a small amount, uh, the owner would need to amend the outline plan and demonstrate how future servicing will come to this site because that future servicing is not actually engineered at this point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Thanks, uh, Mr. Welton, for that. Um, <clears throat> just a question. Uh, does the city have any specifications on uh, the need for water servicing through indoor commercial recreation facilities? Is that something that we look at at all when we're approving these types of plans? I am not aware of such standards, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and then just one final question. Uh, to your knowledge, Mr. Welpton, uh, the indoor aspect of the volleyball courts, would they be hard surface or would they just be like indoor, outdoor volleyball, beach volleyball courts? Uh, through the mayor, uh, my understanding is, is that the indoor courts would be beach volleyball, so it would be on sand. Uh, but the applicants are here to make a presentation, and uh, I, I would recommend that, uh, that you ask the applicants that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councilor Thiessen. Uh, Mr. Walton, is this, a, is this intended to be an interim use or is this the ultimate use of this property? And if it is an interim use, is there any shadow planning that exists in any level of city documentation to sort of what, to guide what the ultimate use may be? Um, through you, the mayor. To me, uh, to me. To me. <laughs> through you. Uh, the, um, when the outline plan was adopted, I believe there was a shadow plan that identified some potentially this, this area as uh, like future single family residential. Um, I would imagine in the long term that this is probably an interim use. Uh, I can't say that this is, you know, like whether interim is two, five, 10, 20 or 30 years, uh, you know, as urban development kind of, uh, continues to move westward or eastward in, in this area, uh, you know, the, uh, the area that's not part of this development because the site is quite large and they're not int intending to utilize all of it for this thing. Uh, n other development will occur on the site and, uh, and you know, there, it may continue to be this indoor and outdoor commercial use. Uh, the owners might decide to, you know, do something different with it. Um, and then just ultimately, if this uh, land use bylaw is uh, adopted and the direct control district is established, what would the applicant, uh, what would the landowner have to do to change it to any other use in the future? Um, Mr. Mayor, the, the intention is, is that uh, any, essentially any change or any, you know, any intensification or, or going, going with something that uh, 
generates more traffic, generates more need for water, sanitary, those sorts of things. Uh, the expectation is, is the uh, owner would need to amend the Fieldbrook outline plan, uh, identify the future use, uh, change all the engineer engineering drawings in the outline plan, how and identify how water, sewer, storm, et cetera, are going to be provided, and update all of the design reports for water, sewer, storm transportation. So you know a an amendment to the outline plan is, is obviously a very significant amount of work. And, and so that would be a public process that would require posting notice of that change and consultation with the adjacent property owners? Yes, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, you know, the Fieldbrook outline plan is a statutory plan, uh, has uh, notification requirements basically through the Municipal Government Act, and, uh, and then the land use bylaw amendment would obviously have similar uh, public notification uh, so and pu and public consultation and uh, an engagement uh, plan. Sure. Thank so you, anything Mr. that's anything other than what's proposed in the direct control district would would require that kind of consultation. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue from council. We'll have another opportunity, council, if there are any other questions for administration after the presentations. Um, so I would open the presentation submission portion of the public hearing. Uh, this is an opportunity for anybody that wants to come and speak to the public hearing and uh, proposed amendments. Uh, typically we start first with the applicant or their representatives and so if the applicant was here this evening or somebody here to speak in favor of the application, we'd invite you to come to the uh, presenter's table. I'll turn on the microphones. They're relatively sensitive. We have them pointing somewhat towards you. Um, I just ask that you all introduce yourselves uh, so we can make sure that we have your name for the minutes and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm Bruce Tatry. I'm with Bearstone Associates, uh, representing Kara Anderson and uh, land on my left. Hi, I'm Kara Anderson, a landowner. And I'm her husband, uh, Chad Anderson. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. So uh, by all means, the, the table's yours and uh, take it away with your presentation. Start things off. I, I mean, uh, Mr. Welton did a pretty good job of explaining kind of what's going in here. Sort of a slow, uh, low impact volleyball, outdoor volleyball courts with some indoor volleyball courts in a coverall building, as well as a play area in the existing facility that Bards used to use. Um, whether it's long term, I guess that's more a question for you, Kara. I'm not sure how long do you plan on doing it, but. Uh, how successful we are. <laughs> so I don't see I don't see any change other than that in the near future. It's a fairly significant. Any changes to what's proposed here would would require extensive money and time. So yeah. the the whole objective behind this and the large list behind the conditions basically to sort of hamstring the development into something low impact and kind of low, I guess just low impact. I mean, uh, you know, like Mr. Welton alluded to, if you're change a statutory document, it requires a fair amount of time and money and, and backup, so to speak, for engineering and everything else. And uh, that's really not the intent. It's a, it's a good spot for something like this uh, in an area that's not being used anymore that was really what drove it. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Seem like a good spot to take a look at the fun kids. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so we do have an opportunity for council to ask any questions. And so were there any questions for the delegation? Um, Councillor O'Toole. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, so on a good day, how many athletes would be there? And for how long? So we plan on running like last May. So that would be booked time. So basically the, the indoor volleyball courts would have, um, there's going to be two indoor courts, which is four to six players each court. So it would be very low impact, maybe 20 people at a time that would just rotate through depending on the time. And there's enough parking on site for... Yep, there's the possible existing members bring in their own vehicle. Yeah, there's the existing parts parking area, and then whoops, we can uh, we can also extend it once the snow's gone to where the we can just make more where where the old trailer used to be on that site. Thank you very much again. Okay, I see Councillor Friesen. Councillor Friesen. 
Thank you. Um, so you said it depends on how successful we are. Is this is this a private business venture or part of it private business venture or the whole thing? Okay. Is okay. Um, and did you consider uh, what, if any, other land parcels did you consider in the city? This is the first one that really fit what I what my needs. Okay. So I had I had looked at other commercial lots and stuff, but they would all require a building being built and and a lot more development. This one already had a building that was kid friendly and fairly easy to renovate into my my use. So your needs for now, great. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Blackburn. Mayor Gibbon, uh, thank you again for being here. I think that uh, this is a very interesting proposal and I guess I'm just a little bit curious about the um, the focus on volleyball, um, not because I have anything for or against volleyball, but it seems like a large enough area that it could be the host to a, a number of similar sports. And I wonder if there was any consideration giving um, to uh, either addressing that now or sometime in the future. Uh, sports like other than volleyball. Well, we certainly have room for it. We could set up soccer soccer goals or baseball nets or uh, so far it's just been one step at a time kind of so I haven't looked that far down the road but there's certainly a lot of room for many recreation uh, I take it you saw um, an immediate need for um, volleyball courts did you well originally um, I saw the Vancouver indoor beach volleyball so that was what I was originally going to do, is the indoor beach volleyball, but then the ceiling wasn't high enough inside the <laughs> riding arena, so I thought it would still be a great place for kids, and then we could just build a, a separate building for the volleyball. Yeah, so sand. I just want lots of sand, especially during the winter. <laughs> sure, sure. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I guess I'm just going to ask, you already know the question that's coming forward, but it, on the inside of the indoor recreation facility, is it hard surface or it's all beach volleyball? It's Tell just me. beach volleyball, yeah. Beach volleyball. So glorified sandbox. Awesome. Uh, now, uh, do you anticipate having shower facilities available? Uh, oh, I'm treating it more like an outdoor beach volleyball. So anytime you go to an outdoor beach volleyball court, you just go home sweaty and clean up there. <laughs> so... Thank you. And and I just wanted to confirm from my own knowledge, so uh, there's not going to be anybody uh, resident on the site. I see that the direct control district doesn't allow a residence, and so there won't be anybody there. It will be a, an operation strictly for this volleyball use. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I don't see any other questions from council, so, uh, and if you didn't have anything else, thanks very much for being here this evening to present and answer our questions. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the, this is still a delegation portion or the presentation submission portion of the public hearing. Was there anybody else that wished to speak in support of the proposed uh, application? Anybody else that was here in this evening with the intention to speak in support of the application? Seeing none, was there anyone else here who wished to speak to the application uh, in favor or opposed? Yep, sir, jump, sir, come on forward. Uh, you might have seen that. I'll just ask you to introduce yourself and... Uh, you're welcome to present. And make sure that microphone sort of pointed towards you there. You so, so my name is Derek McLeod. I'm in uh, lot four, block one there. So directly behind parts. So uh, I guess what I wanted to just to voice some concerns. One is obviously I, I think most of you would be aware that most of that area was annexed from county, and originally, obviously, we enjoyed. The, the country atmosphere there. And it, it was annexed under duress. It took quite a process. And I mean, we went through that for years and, and then eventually. It, so, so one thing that's been appreciated is that the city has kind of left it, you know, as is. And I think from some of the comments we've heard, that's somewhat intentional for the time being. So obviously to suddenly see some development right in the backyard there is of a little bit of concern and um, one of the, well, a few concerns. One obviously was, like has been mentioned earlier, was traffic 
there's going to be uh, an increase of people in traffic. So PARDs fit very well into the, the rural community because it was horse horses and, and riding, and there's riding stables there. So it was a relatively seamless activity behind all of us there, fit, fit well. So obviously this activity is going to be different. There's going to be different people coming and for different reasons. And there could be a number of people coming at one time. So that's a concern in terms of traffic. Um, one concern is the development. And I'm still even listening today a little unclear on that, what limitations there are. Talking uh, to the city planner, it sounds like it's fairly specific now. But uh, obviously, once once it's been approved, then then the concern is is you know does it become minimal to change things? So if we want to add other things, if they want to add other things later, as part of the business, who kind of monitors that? At what stage does that become a public process that you know neighbors obviously have a say in? The third concern would be security. Um, because right now, the back of our properties are not accessible by vehicles. So there's uh, no development in that sense. So not that everything, anything in this town is impermeable by any means, but obviously right now it's, it's field and it's cultivated and whatnot. So we don't have to worry about a lot of vehicle traffic or people behind there, even wondering you know, what they're doing in the evening, that kind of thing. So security is one thing in terms of whether it's going to be a secure facility in the evenings, like after hours in the, in the, in the night. How much is it going to be extended to the west behind uh, all the properties? And uh, are we going to be able to keep people from coming into our backyards? So a lot of us have things stored there because they've been relatively safe there uh, over the years. We haven't had issues. So now it kind of opens up. Um, that concern. So those are those are the concerns that I have, and um, obviously development security being, you know, in terms of specifying what the development is going to be, so that you know we don't down the road see a go kart track behind us suddenly and a lot of noise and activity till late at night, which totally goes against uh, you know the reasons that we're there. So. And, and I appreciate, obviously, things have changed and there's some development going to happen. But as it stands right now, we've been able to, the subdivision planning that, you know, that's all been kind of stalled with economy and that's been uh, regressed for quite a while. So we see that continuing. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a jump forward. So just to, um, and, and I may ask administration to, to uh, provide some additional information, but um, from looking at the bylaw, um, it is it is pretty specific in terms of what is allowed, and anything that isn't specifically allowed would not be allowed and would trigger this whole kind of process again. So in terms of notification of the neighbours and posting things and all that sort of stuff, so the same process that's happening today would be required to do anything that isn't uh, explicitly allowed in what's being proposed. And I would, the thing I think that jumps out to me specifically about the concern that you raised is that uh, when it talks about development standards, uh, it says that it shall be limited to, and there's a bunch of stuff that it limits, um, but the one that stands out is development of a commercial recreational facility outdoor shall be limited to the development of not more than four beach volleyball playing courts at the location shown in, and there's a map that goes along with it. And so it's pretty specific down to saying four courts exactly as shown in the map that was presented. Um, so uh, it is it is very very specific to the uses there. Um, it uh, and I would maybe ask administration in terms of the interpretation of the uh, commercial recreational facility outdoor uh, or indoor. Are there other types of commercial recreational facilities that would be allowed under this direct control district, um, a go kart track or a something some other kind? Like a batting cage was mentioned earlier, or like baseball. But I think it mentioned specifically in in the bylaw about batting cages as an example. So, right. Mr. Welton, uh, through the mayor, Mr. Mayor, the um, if this was not a direct control district, or if there was nothing else limiting the use in the bylaw, uh, then anything that is identified in the definition for commercial recreation outdoor 
uh, could potentially be allowed, and that does include things like go-kart tracks. What we've done in this DC-24 is limited it, limited outdoor recreation to four beach volleyball courts. Okay. So those, that's the only that, that is, outdoor recreation yeah. that could happen under the what's being proposed today. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, and Mr. Walton, do you have do you have the uh, the site plan map? I don't. I'm, I'm, we have it in our council package. I don't know if the, the neighbors would have seen it. And can you maybe disorient us? Um, this is a, a detail. It's not the entire parcel. Um, I know on ours uh, up near the top, it shows how that site uh, aligns with all of the lots that are immediately south of it. So we sort of zoomed in on the right hand side of that larger site. Is that uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I've kind of just sort of scrolled down a little bit. The uh, the top of the page is the entire lot one. Uh, the uh, the red boxes on the far east side of the property are what is kind of like blown up on this portion. And so you can actually see that the uh, the intention is, is that development will be limited to the far east side of the site. Thank you. And, uh and are there any new requirements for fencing uh, or uh, or any other sort of uh, changes to the site? Uh, through the mayor, the uh, requirement for fencing didn't come up sort of in our in the review. Uh, it is not so it, it's not identified as a requirement in this DC twenty four district. Okay. Okay. So it's like a little bit better orientation on the site at least. I wasn't certain if uh, the public had seen that. Thanks for showing that, Mr. Rollin. Um Were there any other questions that you had for council or any other comments that you wanted to make? Uh, well, basically, if the applicants are willing to do anything in terms of addressing the concerns about security along that fence line, that would be a big concern to us and to the other landowners talking to them as well, is that our, that our uh, belongings so on are secure. There's some sort of visible boundary between, I could say wall, no, <laughs> visible boundary between the... Uh, our property and, and the activity and 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 uh, you know I appreciate words like intent but I mean they mean nothing in five years from now no one will remember this conversation so um, that's what I'm just concerned about in terms of you know in, in terms of the applicants and, and their vision and all fairness to them um, what they foresee in terms of developing that along that towards the west so but security fencing and obviously a secure fence, something that is a good boundary is is a big concern to us. Okay. Well, um, I do see Councillor Bressy has a question for you here. Councillor Bressy. Thanks. Thanks for coming to speak to us. I appreciate it. I'm just curious. I'm looking at the site plan, and it looks, from the site plan, it looks like there's already a fence, fence there. Is there not already? No. Parts removed it, but it was only like a horse fence, like with uh, wooden posts and barbed wire. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue, um, and I will just say that uh, to your point about um, you know intentions and people not remembering the conversation, that's exactly why the uh, direct control district exists. Um, the intentions have to be fully captured on the page, and if they aren't captured and explicitly stated on the page, then anybody that wants to do anything different than what was written down um, is required to go through this whole thing again. So it, it is probably the the way that the city handles uh, development with the most uh, certainty for surrounding properties. Appreciate your concerns about uh, security, um, but in terms of what can be built there, uh, it actually doesn't get any more specific than, than the way that the city has it here. Uh, and so I think the intention is fully captured there. And if the intention changes, then they are required to do this kind of process again. Uh, and the neighbors that are adjacent would hear about it. Um, but I don't see anybody else with any questions. Thanks very much for coming forward to bring up Just those concerns. One, one more question. So what would be the process of, in terms of um, basically in asking about the, about the fence, is it basically then that we would maintain our disapproval of the application so we can discuss that or negotiate that or what's the process for that? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, well, so what we're doing today is uh, dealing with the zoning of the property uh, and you may be talking about something that's a little bit more at uh, the development permit stage. So um, the area that your home is on has a residential zoning um, and when you went to go, which is one process, uh, kind of what we're doing here. And when you went to go and build something on that site, you had to go and 
get or whoever built that home had to go and get a variety of permits um, to allow them to build exactly what it was that they built. Uh, there may be an opportunity to address uh, things like site fencing through development permit um, requirements. It's not typically done at a zoning level. because We're talking about what can go on the site, not the specifics of um, uh, down to the sort of a fencing level of detail. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I guess I would share with you is um, you potentially have a new neighbor and in my experience, I've shared the expense of fences with a number of neighbors, and that's typically an over-the-fence conversation that you say, hey, neighbor, um, how are we going to handle this you know, sort of um, issue in between our two properties? So that's that's more of a personal, that's not a city process recommendation, um, but I would just in terms of experience of dealing with, with neighbors and fences, that's at least a part of the conversation. Mm. So, so, so if I was to say now that we object unless there is a fence, does that you, clarify that's, it? That's, that's fully within your rights to say that, absolutely. Okay. And where do we go from there? Then council will, at the end of the presentation submission portion, where everybody gets a chance to uh, sort of uh, bring forward their concerns, uh, council will close that, and then council will discuss and debate what we heard, and we will decide on uh, the district that was presented to us and whether we approve it, uh, whether we amend it, or whether we don't approve it. So that's sort of the three options that are in front of us. Okay, so for the record, then I'll say that and we can go from there. Certainly, appreciate that, thanks. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Councillor Bressy, you had something further? Uh, thanks again, just a, just a question on security. I'm kind of curious how, so to be honest, I'm kind of surprised with security being brought up just because often getting more people in an area makes it more secure and that's, that's one of the ways I know we as a city have talked about making areas concerned more safe is by getting recreational uses there so you have and people randomize random random foot traffic to kind of discourage those bad characters from being around. I was kind of curious, was there any noticeable di difference in property security or issues in the neighborhood before and after parts was around? Was there anything noticeable when they left that happened? Uh, well, we've been on that property, us, and actually our neighbors too. We've been there for 17 years and parts is already there, so we've We've never had anything to compare to, but the the concern there is that now people that a variety of people have an access to the back, right? So visibility. So in the past, no one no one sees what's in the back of your property, right? So we have we have trailers, we have equipment, we have vehicles, we have other items of value that are parked back there, and we've never had any concern about anybody being even really aware of them because they'd have to see them from from the front access road, which it's three acres. So trees, it's very difficult for anybody to really see what you have behind there. So so I actually, to be honest with you and be frank with you, I see it opposite. Now, now you have a, a variety of demographics that are coming and some obviously quite legitimately to enjoy sports. But I mean, obviously we, you guys probably more than anyone recognize what's gone on in the community and, and security is a concern. And uh, so that that's the concern in terms of that kind of access to the back there. And suddenly the, the back of your property is exposed. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm really glad I asked. It is different than a very urban setting where you already have those those eyes and you're right, it is a very different context. So I'm really glad I asked you instead of just going by my assumption. I'm kind of curious, you talk about you'd like to see a fence there. What kind of, what kind of fence do you want? Is the main concern make sure that just stuff can't be hauled across? Is it to make sure that stuff can't be visible? Is it to, is it just to denote that this is private property? What, what are your ex expectations or hopes with that? Uh, well, for no visibility, which obviously lots of subdivisions have those kind of perimeter fences and also high enough that it discourages someone from just leaping over it and unbound and being able to access the back of your property. So that'd be the two things that you know, reasonably that it's going to discourage people from coming back there. And then also visibly, if people don't see what's back there, it's, it's uh, a lot more discouraging, or it, obviously it doesn't create as much potential for somebody to see something that, that they're interested in. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Bressi. I don't see anybody else in the queue, so it looks like we got through our lineup of questions. Thanks very much for being here this evening. Was there anybody else that wished to come forward with respect to this uh, zoning application. I'll ask one last time if there's anybody else that wished to come forward this evening. 
Uh, if not, I'll close the delegation portion. Okay, I don't see anybody else coming forward, so we'll close the presentation submission portion of the public hearing, and we'll move on to uh, one last opportunity for council to ask any questions they might have of administration. Any questions for administration council before we close the public hearing, move on to business arising? Uh, Councillor Palat. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Just in light of the conversation with the gentleman that was just up about uh, security, um, we did have a, the slide that I think had went up there and it kind of shows the volleyball courts. Do we know kind of a, uh, how far the, it's a pretty big site, so I don't know if, how far the proposed volleyball courts would be from the back of the property, from the outside property line to the, I guess, to the south? Mr. Wallace? Uh, through the mayor, uh, yeah, I'm just I'm calling up this uh, this uh, site plan again. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a well, actually, what I'll say is like this dimension here from from this to the property line is 40 meters. So if you figured like the, from that little dot right there to here is 40 meters. So from here say to here might be 500 meters because I think that the entire width of this lot is about 600 meters and, and maybe more specifically from the south edge of the volleyball court to the property line immediately south is it would it be about roughly that same 40 meters is that um, just judging by these dimensions here I would imagine that it's about 25 meters to the property line Thank you. Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my question for administration is, are there any other indoor or outdoor recreation facilities in the city that we have required security fencing? Or, and or are there any neighbourhoods that um, complain about individuals from recreational facilities uh, getting into their backyards and that sort of thing. So I'm thinking about like the, the golf courses that back right on to um, Country Club West, for instance, that pitch and putt. Um, there's ball diamonds that uh, back on to or are across from houses, that sort of thing. Is there, is there any anything that we do require security fencing on? I'm not aware of either. I mean, you mentioned a couple of scenarios. I'm not aware of, of any concerns or requirements uh, for this sort of thing any, anywhere else in the city. Thank you. Councillor Platt. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, just, I guess, another question for administration. On that drawing again, just looking at uh, the site plan, um, what, I mean, uh, the, the conversations around the volleyball and the realization of the, of the current buildings, but what's going to happen on that lot to the, I guess, west of there, all the way towards Fieldbrook? Is that still going to remain just like a oh. field or? Um, through the mayor, the intention is at this stage with this amendment that the remainder of this site would remain undeveloped uh, until some future date when uh, uh, a outline plan amendment is is submitted with design reports and a intention uh, for some uh, intensified use of the site. So right now, what this DC district allows is. Uh, the limited, you know, amount of stuff on the far east side of the site, and the rest, I would imagine, is just going to remain farmed. So, Bressy. Great, thank you. I know that we've had a discussion re discussion recently with another direct control district where fencing was a big part of the discussion. I'm just kind of curious, at what point or what criteria does administration use to determine when that should be something that's has to be included? Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm kind of drawing a blank at this one, Mr. Mayor. Um, the uh, you know, my I guess what I would what I would suggest kind of very generally is is if there are circumstances that that a development are uh, that a development would create uh, if they're creating some sort of a hazard that that you would want people to be kept out of. Uh, that would kind of be the main reason, the, the number one reason why you would want a developer to actually uh, put in fencing is to keep people off the property because uh, their uncontrolled access might create a hazard for them being there. 
Uh, to me, that's really the main one. Uh, uh, other than that, kind of fencing is often just sort of a, I guess, a convenience thing to, uh, yeah. So I think I'll stop there, Mr. I can't, I can't think, uh, Councillor Ressi, I can't think of a of an instance where administration recommended fencing as a part of a direct control district. Uh, I certainly can't think of where council chose to do it, uh, but I can't think of an, an instance where administration thought to. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that was in with respect to uh, urban density development uh, and uh, urban scale in terms of size of fence. Certainly this is different because it is in our rural service area and we're talking about much larger land areas. So there's probably only been one instance. I don't think it was recommended by administration and it was something that came after the fact uh, added by council. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue with questions for administration. So then I'll close the public hearing and we'll move on to business arising. I would look for uh, a motion to get us started uh, with discussion and debate. I'm looking for a motion for first reading. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I'd move that council give first reading to bylaw C-1260-103 being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. So uh, we don't have any discussion or debate on first reading. Uh, so I will call for the vote on first reading. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given. I would move that Council give second reading to bylaw C-1260-103. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. So on second reading is where we can have discussion and debate. Uh, we'll open up for discussion and debate on the proposed uh, rezoning with the direct control district as proposed. Um, is there any discussion and debate from Council? I don't see anybody in the queue. Um, so I will, uh, I will say that I will be supporting the uh, proposed amendment. Uh, I appreciate the specificity of the uh, proposed direct control district. It is very, very specific um, and in a lot of ways limiting to the applicant. If they wanted to add ball diamonds or any other things, they actually wouldn't be able to do that uh, without a change. And so it speaks to their intent. Um, I also appreciate the concern of the adjacent landowners who are seeing a new use come into their area, uh, which is a change. Um, I think that at this stage, um, it's reasonable to wonder what will happen because of that and to want to take some steps to make some improvements. Um, and I believe that a conversation between neighbors can find a way to satisfy some of those concerns. Um, so that's why I will uh, personally be supporting uh, the proposed amendment and proposed rezoning. I don't see anybody else in the queue with any comments. Uh, so I will call for the vote. Please vote on second reading. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given. I'd move that Council have third reading of bylaw C-1260-103 at this meeting. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. So this is a motion to have third and final reading here this evening. Um, in order for uh, us to have that third and final reading, this motion must pass unanimously. Uh, if it doesn't pass unanimously, then that third and final reading would come back at a future Council meeting, at our next Council meeting, I should say. Is there any discussion and debate as to the merits of having third and final reading this evening? I don't see anybody ringing in, so I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I would move that Council give third reading to bylaw C-1260-103. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on third and final reading? Again, I don't see anybody ringing in, so I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, that concludes all of our business for this uh, creation of this direct control district. It has been approved by council. Um, and uh, anybody that wanted to follow up in terms of process could uh, connect with the administration, understand what the process is from here on out. Um, but for our purposes this evening, we're going to move on to item 6.2. Uh, bylaw C-1260-79, land use bylaw housekeeping amendments. I'd call this public hearing to order and look to Mr. Drosch for an introduction. Mr. Drosch. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, so the proposed bylaw is an amendment to the land use bylaw and is the housekeeping amendment. So um, on an annual basis, administration compiles minor changes required to the land use bylaw to correct minor mistakes or provide greater clarification or simplify processes. And so this is the 2018 amendments 
Um, so uh, the first set within this bylaw, uh, I've grouped them all together for simplicity, but they're just correcting grammatical or spelling errors. For example, in one instance, the word access was accidentally put in as success, which we understood the intent, but could create some confusion. So the following sections are being amended for textual errors such as that. Um, the following item, permeable surface landscaping, is a clarification on what we consider to be a permeable surface. Now, the reason for this change is that we had applicants coming in and they were claiming that they were creating a decorative rock garden or something like that where it would be considered landscaping, but in reality, they were laying down gravel to extend parking areas where it wasn't permitted. So unfortunately, we are adding uh, a minimum aggregate size, which restricts the materials that could be used for more creative purposes, but closes this loophole. Um, the next item is clarification on hard surfacing. So one of the issues we've also faced is that the restriction on having hard surfacing within uh, half a meter of a property boundary um, has been used as a loophole because people would say, oh, well, we're providing sidewalk and not driveway, and so I can pave this area. And so the issue there is that the intent of the bylaw was to preserve a drainage channel between the two properties. And so the wording is being changed to say hard surfacing rather than driveway to close this loophole. Um, the next item, industrial business center. And so section 16.1.J clarifies when you would need an additional development permit. So right now the section states that uh, in a commercial business center, you don't need a new permit to put in a permitted use in an existing building. So if there's a strip mall and you could have a retail store in there and that store closes down and a new business goes in, you don't need a retail uh, new permit for that project. Now, we didn't have industrial business centers included in that clause, um, but based on the intent of it, it seems straightforward that industrial business centers should be considered in the same way to simplify uh, the changing of businesses in existing buildings. The next item is the permit extension process. Now, this, uh, this amendment is to kind of clarify that process and make it a little bit simpler. So right now, the wording indicates that um, you're only allowed an extension of a development permit to a maximum of two years. Your first extension of one year can be approved by a, a uh, development officer. However, anything beyond that first year has to go to committee. So this wording change allows uh, additional one-year extensions to be granted so that if there were extenuating circumstances where a development could be completed within two years after those first two extensions, another one-year extension uh, could be considered by the development officer. And this amendment also allows a development officer to consider those extensions rather than the um, Infrastructure and Protective Services Committee. And so this just makes it simpler to get extensions on development permits. Uh, the next item is fire lanes. So this update is just to reflect current engineering standards, which is a six meter uh, fire lane, whereas the bylaw currently states a 9.15 meter requirement. And so that's a big discrepancy. Um, the following item, is uh, accommodating distilleries and wineries under existing definitions. So AGLC changed requirements to make it simpler to develop distilleries and wineries in Alberta. Uh, this occurred after the brewery amendment was made to the land use bylaw. However, we feel that the original intent of the brewery uh, amendments to the land use bylaw also are um, appropriate for distilleries and wineries. So in order to incorporate these types of uses into the land use bylaw in the simplest way, we're simply adding them to the existing definition of brewery. Um, and so in addition to adding these uses to the definition, the proposed amendment also removes the clause setting a threshold for uh, production to differentiate between uh, a regular brewery and a microbrewery. And the reason we're removing this threshold is because uh, it would be very complicated to enforce uh, production limits in terms of land use, uh, simply because a development officer is not going to go out and monitor that. 
And further, the threshold was not in alignment with the AJLC licensing requirements. It was our own kind of standard to distinguish between the two scales of businesses. So rather than creating a standard that could potentially conflict with licensing requirements or building code, we simply removed that statement to simplify the definitions. So to, to provide greater clarity as to what we're referring to, um, I have brewery, distillery, and winery uh, compared to microbrewery, micro winery, and micro distillery here. So what you can see is um, the first few items in black are staying the same as the current definition. So brewery, distillery, and winery, it's intended for industrial districts. Uh, it may have an excess reuse, such as a restaurant or retail space, but that is not a requirement. And there's no provision regarding odor, uh, simply because these go in heavier industrial uses where certain uh, nuisances are deemed appropriate or uh, acceptable, I mean. Um, and then on the other side, microbrewery, microwinery, and micro distillery. Again, this is the same as the current definition. They're intended to be in commercial areas. They're required to have an accessory use as a retail, such as a retail space or restaurant to be appropriate within those commercial areas. Uh, and there is a provision regarding odors, which allows us to take enforcement action if uh, business becomes a nuisance. Uh, so to clarify that, um, controlling odors at the development permit stage doesn't quite make sense, but if we wanted to go and do enforcement later on once a business is operating, having that clause in their development permit gives us a uh, legal document saying that this is a standard that we expect to be upheld. And so if there was an issue, we could go in and use that to uh, force them to take remediation measures. Um, and now here in red is what is being changed and it's removing the production numbers. So the current definition of brewery, uh, destroying, uh, just brewery on its own, excuse me, uh, defines it as something that produces more than 15,000 hectoliters of beer annually, whereas the, uh, the microbrewery uh, is anything under that. And so those are the requirements that we're taking out to avoid any confusion with AGLC licensing requirements. Now, to provide a bit of greater clarification, I've just included this information on where each use is uh, either permitted or discretionary. This isn't being changed, but I just wanted to highlight the two uh, intended differences. So you can see brewery, destroy, and winery would be discretionary in general industrial and heavy industrial districts and not permitted in any specific district. Um, and so, again, this is not a change. This is how it is in, how it is in the existing bylaw. Compared to microbrewery and then micro winery and micro distillery, this use is permitted in central commercial, commercial arterial, and industrial business districts. So again, it's that commercial intent versus the heavier industrial uses. Um, so in summary, these uh, amendments are intended to clarify certain processes, correct grammatical errors, and update minor items in the land use bylaw. Administration recommends that council hold all three readings of this bylaw. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Roche. Uh, any questions for administration at this stage, council? I don't see anybody in the queue with questions. We'll have another opportunity. Oh, Councillor Friesen. Okay, well, no, that's, we'll, uh, we'll still uh, just go through. Don't see anybody else uh, with questions. Uh, I'll ask if there was anyone here that was intending to speak to this uh, collection of land use bylaw housekeeping amendments. We have two ladies that are here, and I'm wondering if they wanted to come forward and speak to some of these amendments. It looked like this is exactly what they came for. Uh, maybe, maybe I misjudged. That's okay. Um, I, so, so I don't see anybody coming forward. Uh, and I'll ask one last time if there's anybody that wished to speak to any of these amendments. I don't see anybody coming forward. And so I will uh, close the presentation submission portion of the public hearing. Um, Council, one last opportunity. Any questions for administration? Not seeing any, then uh, Councillor Friesen will move on to you for motions. Thank you. I would move that Council give first reading to bylaw C 1260 79, being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. So I will call for the vote on first reading. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Friesen, would you like to carry on? I would move that Council give second reading to bylaw C-1260-79. Uh, yeah, 
Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Open for discussion and debate on second reading. Councillor Bressy. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor Given. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, as I was reading through this, I had a bit of a challenge with the definitions being given to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, breweries, distilleries, and wineries, and the micro versions of them. And how I originally read this, by, these bylaw definitions for a microbrewery was the the, de the only difference that I saw between a normal operation and micro operation was whether or not smell was a factor or not. And then how I was reading it was, if you could smell it, well, then it has to be in these land use districts. And talk to Mr. Roche, I understand that planning's got a, that, that there's some different ways to read that bylaw and they interpret it differently than I do. But that for me at the very least is a little ping in my head that maybe there's, this could be clarified a little bit. I also wonder if we're getting rid of production limits, do we need a different definition for breweries versus microbreweries and normal operations versus regular operations? I think a big concern I've got about this is another use that wasn't listed is we've got microbreweries are permitted uses in industrial general areas. And the way that I read the bylaw, it would make it appear to me that a small time operation opening up an industrial area needs to have a tap room or restaurant or a store attached to it. And we understand why we'd require that in a commercial area, but that, I definitely don't think that's the intent of an operation in an industrial area. So. I think there's some disclarity here, and I wonder as the industry's changed if we need to differentiate between the two different kind of breweries. So I think that I'm not comfortable with these definitions myself. At the same time, I don't think right now is the proper venue to make definition changes on the fly. So I'm going to make a motion that would have the effect of maintaining this, if it passed, would have the effect of maintaining the status quo for now, but then allowing us to have more discussion in the future. And what my motion is, is I move that council remove the definitions for brewery, distillery, and winery, and microbrewery, micro winery, and micro distillery from the bylaw amendment, and that council refer updated definitions for brewery, distillery, and winery, and microbrewery, micro winery, micro distillery to the appropriate standing committee for discussion. So I'd love us to discuss this further. The intent of this isn't to ask administration to go away and do a whole bunch of work and set us up for a, for a conversation. I think we've probably got the information before us we need to have a conversation but i think we could give a bit of direction to give a clear definition here so i hope council will be supportive of this motion okay thanks councillor Bressy. so that uh, motion is uh, specific in terms of um, proposing an amendment to the uh, land use bylaw amendment um, but it is uh, specific in that it only addresses sort of the um, the the brewery uh, winery related issues um, and not all the rest of the housekeeping amendments. So the, the effect of supporting council Bressie's motion would be that those changes related to brewing uh, would be held back and the current land use bylaw would persist, would, would stay in those areas and all the other changes uh, council could vote on uh, going forward um, by passing it, by passing the rest of the overall land use bylaw amendment. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Kevin. Um, with with all due respect to uh, Councillor Bressy and his concerns about this, um, uh, in my reading, the the definitions are are, are quite clear, and and I, I appreciate what um, Mr. Deroche added to the presentation that helped make those things clear, and um, I'm not sure that uh, additional work is necessary in order in order for the uh, bylaw to be clear and appropriate. So I would be, um, I would not be in favor of this amendment. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, any other discussion or debate on Councillor Bressy's amendment? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, much like uh, Councillor Blackburn, I, uh, I I read it completely differently. Um, the big one for me is with the microbrewery, microwinery, is that uh, it has to be built in conjunction with uh, some other. Uh, drinking establishment or restaurant uh, that abides beside it. Uh, whereas the brewery, it seems like it is it is and it isn't. Um, I think smell is uh, marginal, especially with uh, what uh, Mr. DeRoche has uh, put forward for council here tonight and in, uh, in, in and above beyond what we saw in our package. And I think it clarifies it nice and clear and uh, I'm not as opposed to, to it as it's presented. So, Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor O'Toole. Thanks very much, Mayor Given. I won't be supporting this either, uh, just for the reasons that were brought up by my two fellow councillors. Thanks, Councillor Cole. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue, and so I would go to Councillor Bressy to close. Councillor Bressy? 
Thank you. Something something I will say is, as I do my research for this, I talked about this definition with uh, with three different people who are involved in this industry here in Grand Prairie, and two who are involved in Grand Prairie, in Calgary. And all of them, when they looked at this definition, their eyebrows went up, and their and two, at least two of those responses weren't weren't polite while we were doing this. Also, in my research, I looked at a number of municipalities in Alberta, and maybe they're out there, but I couldn't find any municipalities that differentiated between my, and maybe I just wasn't looking at the right spots in their bylaws, but I had troubles finding municipalities that differentiate between microbreweries and breweries. And one example of what's going on in the industry right now is sours are very, becoming very popular, where they use a yeast that, uh, that can contaminate an entire brewery. So a lot of breweries are se setting up a second operation off-site, and the ones that I've toured, they'll have exactly one fermenter in them. And under our bylaw or under the interpretations of it, that wouldn't be called that wouldn't be considered a microbrewery if they had a single fermenter in it, which seems kind of weird to me that we're calling something even just the fact that we're calling something micro and it has nothing to do with size seems kind of off to me. And even right there, it's just something that I don't think makes sense in our land use land use bylaws. So I really get the intent of this and I really get the need of why we need to update these definitions. But I think we're bring we're introducing definitions that just really don't make sense to me, and they don't make sense to people in the industry that I've run them by. Okay, thanks for that close, Councillor Bressy. So uh, that is the close for Councillor Bressy's proposed amendment, basically to strike the changes uh, proposed to the brewery uh, and brewing section, all-inclusive, distilling, brewing, and winemaking. Um, so I will call for the vote on Councillor Bressy's uh, amendment. Please vote. Thank you. Um, that does not carry, uh, so we will continue uh, with discussion and debate on second reading uh, as originally proposed. Any other discussion and debate on second reading as originally proposed? Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Gibbon. Um, nobody will be surprised that I'm always happy to see amendments that have to do with grammar and spelling, and so I support that from this um, perspective. And uh, just to speak once more to the definitions for um, breweries and microbreweries, um, I, I appreciate that, that the wording may be a little bit obscure unless you look very, very closely at how, the, how it's laid out. However, I do really think that the intent is uh, sufficient to um, allow us to include that with other housekeeping items rather than as a separate item. I'm definitely in support of uh, the motion. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. I don't see anybody else in the queue. Anybody else wish to speak on second reading? Okay. Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Friesen, would care to do our motion to have. Thank you. So I would move that Council has third reading of bylaw C-1260-79 tonight at this meeting. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. So as with our last one, this is a motion to have third and final reading here this evening. In order for it to pass, it must pass unanimously. Uh, and if it doesn't, then uh, third and final reading would come back at our next City Council meeting. Is there any discussion to de debate as to the merits of having third and final reading this evening? I don't see anybody in the queue. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that um, at this point... Uh, failing to have third and final reading wouldn't likely change the ultimate outcome of uh, the amendments. And uh, and so I think it would probably be preferable for industry and administration and everybody just to get certainty by passing the amendments as proposed here this evening. Um, so that was my bit on discussion and debate. Uh, I don't see anybody else, so I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion does carry unanimously, uh, so we can move on to third and final reading. Councillor Friesen. Thank you. I move that Council gives third reading to bylaw C-1260-79. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Any discussion or debate on third and final reading? Seeing none, uh, please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Um, I think that handles all of our public hearing business. 
And we had no items of unfinished business, and so that'll take us to our two additional agenda items. Uh, the first being item 8.1, uh, public member appointments for 2019. I think we were going to start off first with the Grand Prairie Airport Commission and Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, I'm pleased to move that uh, Council appoint Doug Anderson to the Grand Prairie Airport Commission for a three-year term ending December 31st, 2021. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn. Is there any discussion or debate with respect to the motion? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Um, and then our other uh, public appointments were on the Economic Development Advisory Committee. <laughs> Councillor Clayton, I have that rather long list. I do. I don't have the motion in front of me, so correct me if I'm uh, wrong. However, I would move that Council recommend the following names for an appointment, um, a two-year appointment to the Economic Development Committee. Um, Dennis Hussey, Vince Joyal, Pete Merlot, Abe Neufeld, Darren Olson, Cindy Park, and Dean Radburn. Okay, okay thanks very much. And just for clarity, I think that's to a term ending December 31st, 2020. You bet. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Clayton. Uh, any discussion or debate on uh, the proposal? Councillor Bressy. Great. My apologies to Council that I can that I had another community commitment I couldn't be at when we discussed this. I'm just curious, was there any discussion, and forgive me if we had this at a meeting months ago that I was, actually was president, it just strikes me that all of a sudden we, we're going to face a time with this where we don't have any members left in our committee. Was there any talk about potentially doing a rolling term or how we'd address that? Sure, ab absolutely there was. Um, at least a part of it was a recognition that this is a relatively new approach for this committee. In the past, the city had done a, a sector-specific sort of ongoing uh, body to consult with, um, and that was successful for a period of time. Um, this new committee differs in that at least its startup phase is going to be specifically focused on providing input and guidance for the city's long-term, the development of the city's long-term economic development plan. And after that, their role would change. So I think the thinking here is to have everybody provide that guidance at the early stage. And then after a year of sort of operational to reassess what the needs of the committee are at that point. Uh, any other discussion or debate? Okay, seeing nobody ringing in, then I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Uh, and that brings us to item 8.2. Uh, which is a uh, recommendation uh, to a, appoint a city manager. Uh, as council knows, uh, director, former director Glante has been acting uh, as city manager in the acting or interim role uh, as city manager since uh, October 2018. Um, I'm pleased uh, to uh, recommend to council that uh, we appoint him as, remove the I in interim, uh, and have him as the uh, regular and full city manager. Of course, this is, as council knows, this is after an exhaustive search uh, using a professional search firm. Uh, council's been intimately involved in that process, so this doesn't come as a surprise to anybody around this table. Um, but uh, that is the recommendation that council was all aware of, but we do have a formal piece of business to do to make that uh, a formal and ongoing uh, appointment. And so I would look for a motion to uh, appoint Mr. Glante as the city manager. Councillor O'Toole. Mayor Gibbon, I'd be very proud to make that motion to make uh, Mr. Horatio Galanti the new city manager okay. of the city of Grand Prairie. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Well, that, that's pretty easy then. So far, I'd, I, I, I would just want to, I would just want to uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Glante, for your support in the interim role. Uh, I want to recognize the work that you did on relatively short notice, taking on that position, uh, guiding uh, our administration team and council through our budget discussions, um, and certainly want to recognize your work in your previous role as infrastructure and protective services uh, director, uh, covering the largest service area in the city portfolio with a huge amount of responsibility. And I guess I would say that if you thought that was fun, just wait till you uh, get to really start to enjoy the city manager role. Um, but I think uh, I'll speak for myself, and hopefully it's for all of council when I say that we're pleased to have you. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Ex yeah, the, the, the joke's going around saying, boy, it's going to be awkward now that we've clapped if we don't actually vote for him. So maybe I should call for the vote 
Uh, before we get too far, uh, please vote. Thank you, and the votes all came in quite quickly, so that motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, and congratulations. <laughs> okay, and uh, that handled all of our additional items, and that'll take us into our regular committee business, starting with item 9.1, the Community Living Committee from February 12th. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I'd move that Council approve the minutes of the Community Living Committee meeting held uh, February 12th, 2019. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Are there any errors or omissions, gram grammatical, spelling or otherwise, that we need to take care of? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Motion carries. Councillor Thiessen, anything you want to highlight in that sentiment? Yeah, I guess. Uh, you know, normally I have a motion coming out of this committee, but uh, uh, there was a couple delegations uh, that came forward. Uh, one was uh, Mr. Lloyd Shirk uh, from the Snowbird 8 Memorial Project. The other was uh, from Ms. Marcy Lavallee of the Troyan Ukrainian Society. Both came to committee uh, seeking out funding. Uh, one for the Snowbird uh, Memorial down at the airport. Uh, that uh, that request was moved forward to uh, administration to identify specific funding sources for either fifty or ten thousand dollars total. Uh, whereas the Triana Society for Ukrainian Heritage Culture and the damage assessed to their building was uh, not moved forward for any further uh, action. Uh, I'll just give a, outside of that we had a verbal update on the rural transportation pilot program by Director R. Lynn Miller. Um, it seems there is some uptake, but still it's a small sample size, so uh, we, I'm sure I'll get a new update tomorrow when we sit again. Uh, other things to discuss is our Community Connections magazine has been released online, and it should be in print as I'm speaking this right now. Uh, also, uh, Community Social Development, uh, just uh, highlight uh, approximately 360 people attended the opioids launch and video on February 5th. Uh, the task force is now coordinating sessions in the community using the videos and education material and a community survey uh, has been released uh, in regards to housing and affordable housing recently and hopefully we'll find some uh, some cohesion between those two because I think there's uh, definitely an opportunity to help people in multiple ways through housing. Um, finally, uh, Fleet, one of our electric buses is currently getting an exterior wrap put on it. The other one, many of us councillors was it all of us? It seemed like all of us. A lot of us were there. We're riding the electric bus, so uh, we're really looking forward to the diesel savings in the future and uh, to see the ridership on our electric buses and our electric bus fleet grow. So let's just hope for the best in that regards. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, we'll move on to the Corporate Services Committee meeting. Um, Councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I move the council approve the minutes of the corporate services committee meeting held Tuesday, February 12, 2019, as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? And seeing nobody ringing in, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor O'Toole. I got one motion to come out of this tonight. Uh, Mr. Marcio Rees, Senior Financial Advisor, presented committee with bylaw C-1396 being a lending bylaw. And the proposed bylaw would allow the city to enter into a loan agreement with the city, Swan City Hockey Association as directed by council. And I move that uh, council give first reading to the lending bylaw C-1396 as presented. Thanks very much. Councillor O'Toole, uh, I will call for the vote on first reading. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Um, and uh, do we need to move on to additional readings? That's, was there an intention? Sorry, it was phrased as first reading, and so that's why I didn't ask for discussion and debate. Um, Ms. Walker. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given. So the process uh, with the lending bylaw is that uh, the bylaw itself gets first reading and then it gets advertised for two uh, consecutive weeks. And then there is a 15-day waiting period to allow for a public uh, petition to be received. If no p uh, petition has been received in that time, uh, council then may move on to second and third readings. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for that clarity about the process. 
Um, and so that's all of our business with this one today. Uh, we just heard the process and that will come back uh, at a subsequent council meeting. Uh, Councilor O'Toole, anything else to highlight in that set of minutes? Just we had a uh, verbal uh, service area report uh, and talking about assessment and taxation. That is that time of year. And uh, some facility management staff are monitoring building systems uh, affected by the extreme cold weather. I know that I had a flood in my basement and it was because of the warm weather one particular day. So anyhow, we got our all covered. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, so we'll move on to item 9.3, the Infrastructure and Protective Services Committee meeting. Councillor Clayton. I'd move that Council will approve the minutes of the Infrastructure and Protective Services Committee meeting held Tuesday, February 19th, 2019, as presented. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing nobody in the queue, then I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. And that motion carries. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. Uh, one additional item that I move that Council adopt the 2018 Storm Drainage Master Plan by resolution. Uh, speaking to this motion, just a couple high-level things, and there are some experts in the room if there's technical questions. Um, there was an engineering firm retained in 2017 to undertake a uh, update to our storm drainage master plan. Uh, since the the old plan was established in 2012, um, the city has annexed uh, 6,300 approximate uh, hectares of land, um, and as well, our population grew by almost 35 percent. Um, an updated drainage plan is in ne is needed to support this growth and the annexed land. So I would encourage council to support this. Uh, and as presented. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. Uh, open for discussion and debate, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Just a question for management. I'm kind of curious, so this plan, my understanding is it prepares us for, if it was fully, if we could snap our fingers and have it completely done tomorrow, it would prepare us for a one in a hundred year event. That being said, that's a $98.5 million price tag to get there. So obviously that's not gonna happen tomorrow. I know that there's going to be that management is going to do work with budgets, figuring out how, which which recommendations do we move on, how aggressively do we move on them, when do we do that. I was kind of curious, what's the what's the process or plan for council engagement in terms of us, in terms of council helping set some vision for how aggressively we want to pursue this plan, in terms of council getting the opportunity to say, yeah, we want to go for it as aggressively as we can, or we want to slow play it. Just how's that conversation happen? Well, uh, just since we just recently had uh, put them in the hot seat, I'll maybe look to our city manager because that's more uh, of a overarching question rather than a technical question. Mr. Glanta. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so during the budget process every year, council will have an opportunity to see a list of priorities that the technical experts will, uh, will present uh, based on the master plan. As you mentioned, the master plan is identifying a 100 year event um, that's the ultimate design. However, the level of protection is associated with the level of risk as well. And with the funding available, not only for this matter, but for other priorities in the city. So to respond to your question will be at, at the budget time. And in preparation for that, uh, administration will have uh, presentations in advance to the council to provide information and to prepare council with adequate knowledge uh, in order to vote uh, during the November, November every year, uh, identifying the priorities and why uh, the experts are recommending some items uh, based on resources available. I guess just one additional thing I'd ask, Mr. Galante, um, prior to sort of the recommendations from the technical experts, are those um, recommendations reviewed by the senior leadership team for which ones ultimately show up in front of council? Like, is there a, a not exactly a first cut, but is there a first uh, prioritization that happens before council season? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that is correct. There is a vetting process that is conducted by the corporate leadership team with, uh, where we analyze all the recommendations from the different departments, uh, considering a, a corporate lens and trying to manage the overall budget for the city. So the recommendations that council will see in front of you are previously vetted by uh, the senior management team. Thanks, Mr. Galante. Uh, Councillor Bressi, you had something further? 
Yeah, just a just a comment or a point of confusion on that. Maybe it's maybe there's going to be a slightly different process now that we have an updated plan. But I think that in the past few processes, look at our capital budget. I don't feel that I had any real cap. We were given the individual projects projects on the storm, but we weren't really given in terms of how aggressively we were attack attacking something. So. Uh, so if we decided that if we decided, hey, we're going to implement this plan in the next five years, or we're going to implement it in the, over the next twenty years, or we're planning to never ever even really get there, those would be very different recommendations that come towards council. And I guess how what's the what's the role of us in shaping those recommendations? And are we going to be given tools of budget even to know which approach management is taking as they're shaping those? Councilor Russell, maybe maybe I can take a, a, a swing at that. I think. Um, that kind of direction comes from council in the strategic planning process. Had this council said, uh, for example, that we wanted to um, highlight a strategic area of uh, mitigating risk from environmental disasters, uh, protecting public property, and you know, like, but really focused in on saying it's a priority of this council to deal with water issues and uh, stormwater management. Had we, had we raised that at the strategic priority level in our plan, management would bring be bringing forward capital projects that would be more aggressive in that area. Uh, if likewise, if council said, we want to ensure that we build, and I'll, I'll use something that was, was topical, but you know, if council in our strategic planning had said, we want to ensure that we have um, adequate uh, capital facilities to meet the cultural uh, performance needs of the community, management might have brought us a recommendation saying, here's how you build a performing arts center. Our council didn't do that. Um, we certainly have debated it. But I think that that's where council would give that kind of direction. I think the intent of master plans like this is to guide the city's overall development and planning, because uh, a lot of the areas in the master plan are currently undeveloped. And so I think a big function of the plan is to guide the private development that will happen in those areas over a longer period of time. So so I think I think council gives it strategic direction um, through our strategic plan and the things that we choose to say or not say. And I think it's clear that this council said we're focused on a uh, trying to control property taxes as much as possible. I think that that's been pretty clear, certainly with our budget reduction. Um, and that has probably influenced the types of things that the corporate leadership team bring to council or the volume of things that they bring to us. If we changed our mind and said, no, you know, we're we're not as worried on the whole about um, property taxes and more concerned about pr mitigating risk uh, for private property owners, um, then I think we'd start to see a more aggressive uh, handling of the plan and more recommendations coming forward. It's a bit long-winded, but is that, is that a fair explanation? Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue. Anybody else with any um, comments, questions? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote on uh, adopting the 2018 Storm Drainage Master Plan. Please vote. And that motion carries. Councillor Clayton, anything else you wish to highlight? You bet. Just a couple things on um, the director's uh, service area update. Um, Director, uh, Deputy Director, Mr. Glavin, um, updated that the economic development part department had produced a promotional video. It had been uh, in the first two days that it was distributed. It was shared 486 times. And as well, it was viewed 23,000 times. So within two days, it was viewed 23,000 times. It was also featured at the last week's Growing the North conference, um, which, uh, you know, is a conference for those of you who aren't aware, has been a highlight of economic development in the region for the past 10 years. Um, as well, the uh, administration, administrative services and staff with transportation are currently working on an assessment to analyze the current snow removal processes, which we will see back at IPS um, in the near future. And as well, um, the Planning Development Department uh, staff are currently drafting a terms of reference for the Avondale School Sites Area Redevelopment Plan. Just a couple highlights, but yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. Um, I think that handles all of our committee business, and I don't believe we had any items of correspondence or delegation business or notices of motion this evening. Uh, and so that takes us down to number 13 in council member reports. And uh, we had a, a number of those, and we'll start off first with uh, alphabetically with the Combative Sports Commission and Councillor O'Toole, I believe. Thank you very much. Well, it's uh, XFFC21. It'll be held on Friday, March 15th next month, with weigh-ins taking place at Tractor Jacks 
on March 14th at 4 o'clock. So if you're so inclined, you can go down, bring your autograph book, and the athletes would love to uh, sign autographs. It's uh, now posted as Locked and Loaded is the event title, and it'll be a four-title fight taking place at Terra Center at Evergreen Park. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Tool. Thanks for the update. Uh, next was Disabled Transportation Society. I think, Councillor Friesen, you had that for us. Thank you. So we, uh, <clears throat> just on Sunday, the uh, Disabled Transport uh, Transportation Society had its annual general meeting. Um, and Carla Jamison will be board, uh, the board chair again going forward. She's been on the board for a number of years. Uh, some of the highlights out of the meeting were uh, that the the board over the last year, year and a half, has made a shift from being an operational board to a governance board. And uh, going forward, they will be taking governance training as well to make sure that they're well aware of their uh, limitations and responsibilities as a governance board. And of course, in, coupled with that, they did hire an executive director this past year. Uh, another highlight this past year is the ratification of the contract with uh, for the drivers with the union. And the big work going forward, um, there will be a special general meeting for some bylaw amendments, just some housekeeping matters, of course. Um, but the Disabled Transportation Society is also working really hard to determine how to best meet the challenge of increased demand over the last few years with aging vehicles. So they're getting very serious and this executive director is uh, charged with making sure that uh, we really understand through metrics and evaluation of uh, demand what the ridership requires and what it may look like going forward, um, alternative vehicles, um, whether or not uh, some consideration has to be given to uh, mandate and whether that's narrowing it and, and uh, you know, hoping that another organization picks up some of the slack or expanding it, in which case uh, increased funding is entirely uh, possible that that would be needed. So, and that's kind of coupled with what, uh, with, with some city planning that's going on as well. So the, uh, the executive director is working very closely with our transportation department to make some, uh, some improve, to improve understanding and, and make decisions about how to go forward. Um, and, uh, part of that as well is giving the ridership an opportunity to give feedback. So the date has yet to be announced, but there will be a town hall held, uh, in, uh, it was March or April, uh, so early this spring. Thank you. Thanks very much. Councilor. Um, the next up was, uh, Grand Prairie Airport Commission, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Gibbon. Um, uh, at the risk of of interrupting your alphabetical order, I'd like to report on all three of my committees together, as if that's all right. As long as you do it in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do them in alphabetical order, yeah. Okay, so the first one is uh, the Airport Commission. We held our um, last meeting on uh, February 20th, which was last week, and uh, we were able to review some year-end numbers. And uh, something that I want to point out in all three of my reports um, is has to do with the the social rather than the financial impacts that some of these organizations have on our community. And so I'm going to quote some numbers in, in all three cases. Um, first is the uh, 2018 year-end passenger stats for the airport. Um, we had an 8.1% increase over the number of passengers that traveled in 2017. And um, so there were um, nearly 439,000 passengers that traveled through the airport. In January of 2019, uh, there's a 9% increase over the traffic in uh, January of 2018. So we are seeing uh, a continued increase in use of the airport. Um, uh, other things that we touched on, um, the annual general meeting, as has already been mentioned, will be held on the 25th of March. And um, at that time, the uh, 2018 audited financial statement will pre be presented um, 
uh, it was approved by the board, uh, the commission at the at the last meeting. Uh, we did receive a presentation from the West Peace Aviation Association and the Peace Country Recreational Flyers regarding the Snowbird 8 Memorial Project, which Council has already heard about once. And uh, certainly their intentions are being considered by, by the Commission at this time. And um, that covers it for the airport. Uh, next to tell you about is the Grand Prairie Library Board. Um, we had our meeting again last week and uh, because it was year-end we were provided with some um, some uh, numbers. So I'd just like to share with you that um, the library has in Grand Prairie um, and surrounding area uh, nearly 23,000 members and those members and others visited the library a total of 235,000 times in 2018. And um, our website was visited 130,000 times. So there's lots of access um, to the airport, sorry, to the library being, being enjoyed um, uh, in the community. We had 8,600 adults attending programs um, 7,000 children attending programs and uh, 435 teens attending programs at the library last year. A um, couple of other things that I'll mention is that we have a collection of about 147,000 items and taken from the library to borrow during 2018 was 446,000 items. So the the collection is well appreciated. Um, one of the things I'll mention about the collection is that um, the staff are uh, doing a very aggressive weeding of the collection right now to ensure that our shelves uh, are not filled with books that are damaged, books that haven't been borrowed in a number of years, um, and some of the other items aside from books, so that we're ensured, ensuring that the, uh, the collection is relevant to our our current members. Um, one of the byproducts of that is that they're going to be able to reorganize the, the library shelving to some degree and to provide a little bit more space for people and more light coming in from windows that are currently blocked by shelving. So we're looking forward to seeing um, more space for people and more light in, in the library. Uh, just in terms of um, technology, um, the public computers were used um, for 31,300 sessions in 2018 and we had a, a total of just over 25,000 mobile device connections um, to our public Wi-Fi network um, in, uh, in 2018. So large numbers and I don't expect anybody to remember them all. But I, I do want to say that, uh, that the library serves an important role in our community, and these numbers um, really show that that's the case. And the third one I'll mention is the Grand Spirit Foundation. We met on the 22nd of February, and I would, wanted to provide some stats about the, um, the Grand Spirit uh, facilities that are actually in Grand Prairie. So we have 235 senior lodge units. Uh, only three of them are empty at the moment. We have 122 senior apartments, of which only two are empty. And we have 50 family housing rental units, uh, of which only two are empty uh, at, at this time. So um, the, uh, the units that we oversee and provide for the use of the public are uh, in full use. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about is the um, the wait lists. And I don't have wait lists um, broken down by uh, just Grand Prairie, but I did want to mention the overall numbers. So just to give you the context, the region includes Grand Prairie, Beaver Lodge, uh, Wembley, Sexsmith, Luglass, Spirit River, Rycroft, Wanham, Eaglesham, and Bazanson. Um, and amongst those wait lists, we have a need for 40 senior lodge units, 126 senior apartment units, and 351 family housing rental units. 
And amongst those family housing rental units, we're talking about the need um, uh, to be met for 773 people. So um, the, uh, the demand is great for the services that we offer and um, the support that we give to the Grand Spirit Foundation is, uh, is very much a necessity within our communities. And that ends my three reports. Thank you for your patience. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn. Thanks for those three updates. Uh, and I think our last was the uh, Peace Library System, Councillor Thiessen. Sorry, I'm trying to recover from Councillor Blackburn's uh, last bit of stats there. Quite sobering that, no, 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 sobering. Uh, they talk about bringing back down to earth, like we know there's a need, but uh, to see the vital importance of that, like we're talking about over a thousand people that could require homes in the very near future, the city of Grand Prairie, so, or require them now. So thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, speaking up about those numbers. I did want to talk about a few numbers as well. Uh, it's pretty much what we did this past weekend on February 23rd at the Fairview Provincial Building for Peace Library Systems. Uh, when we gathered members from around the region, uh, we talked about our, uh, our financials. Uh, we, we reviewed our audited and unaudited financial statements and we moved that forward to our general board. Uh, we also took a look at the annual report to municipal affairs, and this is a number that sort of jumped out on me. Councillor Blackburn was talking about the number of books being taken out. Well, Peace Library System, which has a, f a far greater reach, but we also partner with the Grand Prairie Public Library. Uh, as we reported to municipal affairs, uh, over 15 million uh, book withdrawals over the past year as recorded and reported to uh, municipal affairs. So. Uh, you would think uh, this region doesn't have that many people, but 15 million, quite literally, uh, libraries play an important function, and that is no over-exaggeration. Um, also, we got an update on the uh, the situation happening in Grand Cash uh, with, the, with the public library board there. Uh, so when the town of Grand Cash dissolved, so too did the library as per its MGA requirements. Uh, so... Uh, and it severed all of its ties with the, the Grand Yellowhead School Division, uh, so no longer did it have somebody to harbor it. So the MD of Greenview uh, started working together with Peace Library System and staff uh, and established a municipal library board uh, for, uh, for Grand Cash and appointed its members. Uh, Tom Burton is the chair currently of that board for the MD of Greenview. And in so doing, we had to do the technical uh, process which was uh, terminating the memorandum of agreement with the MD of Greenview uh, for the town of DeBolt within our Peace Library system. So in the future we can do a new memorandum of agreement also including Grand Cash and all other libraries that are serviced within the MD of Greenview. Uh, so the new board is in the process of setting up uh, an agreement with the school division and hiring a library manager. A uh, Peace Library system still doesn't have access to the uh, library there but we will be contracting uh, to go set up the barcode systems and ensure that we're tracking all the items that are going through that library too because eventually it's going to wind up under our umbrella as well and all of their core material. Um, and so we'll have to report on that in the future as well. Uh, besides that, uh, it's always great to get together with our regional partners and uh, a fairly quick yet productive meeting. And uh, yeah, that's my report for now. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Um, maybe all those underappreciated things that happen when a municipality changes its status. Uh, who would have thought that uh, you would have to reform the library board uh, of all things, but certainly appreciate that update. Um, and so I guess uh, I think that was all of our council member reports, unless there was anybody that I missed. It doesn't look like there was anybody. And so we'll uh, start with council member roundtable and we'll start with councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, this was a pretty exciting couple of weeks. I uh, got to go to the Growing the North Conference, and there was two speakers that really stood out for me. Um, majority of them were world class, but two that spoke out uh, was Chief Clarence Louis. He runs the reserve down in uh, southern BC near Soyuz and uh, Oliver, and he spoke uh, when he was done uh, his one-hour speech. He had a standing ovation that lasted quite a while. He he really rocked the room, you might say. He was very open, straightforward, got his point, no beating around the bush. He said what he was on his mind. The other one was the gentleman that had the tool shed brewery. And that gentleman there, he was just bound by politics. And it was a guy that wanted, he had this dream. And in order to open up a brewery, he couldn't do it. 
And so what he ended up doing, short and sweet, was he supplied the, the barley to a brewery in B.C. Then he went and got his import license to bring the beer into Alberta, uh, which was just totally against what anybody would think they would have to do. So between getting the, the breweries, the microbrewery population on board, the, uh, the barley producers and the government and the AGLC, they put enough pressure on that that is when the microbrewery business took off and it was because of one guy's determination to make things happen. And uh, most people would have given up he was out of a pocket a lot of money. His wife was kind of looking at him a little bit differently, but uh, that is sheer determination. He was the one that, and uh, he speaks lightly of it, but it was the little guy that made the big difference in the province. And when you look at uh, economic development, you look at tourism, you look at uh, the Barty producers, they all had a big role to play in that. So, like I said, uh, I didn't expect much of the speech but when I sat there he kept you engrossed in the things in a comical way and uh, yeah I'll leave it at that it was a very good growing the north which they usually are so thank you thanks very much Councillor Tool. we'll move to Councillor Bressy great thank you uh, growing the north is also a highlight for me so a big shout out to all of our staff and local organizations that put that on it is as somebody who's takes in a fair amount of conferences, that's a very well done one. So I was excited for that. Uh, two places that I got to go that I found very interesting was just this evening. I was at the, at the board meeting for sunrise house. I was asked to come and hear what they're up to. And I'll share a little bit of what the city's up to. And so, uh, a few stats that they highlighted from me from the city of grand prairie's last point in time count is 22% of our people who are homeless are minors and 37% of everybody in the city that's experiencing homelessness says that they first experienced it when they were minors. And so it was a great reminder for me, if we can make sure that that, that, the first, that somebody who's a minor, that's the first and only time in their lives they're homeless, then we will save them and our community a lot of, a lot of problems in the future. So I'm excited as we're talking about our affordable housing strategy and other ways to do this. I hope that youth are a focus of that. I'm excited to talk about how we can support that organization and other organizations take care of these vulnerable kids in our community. Uh, one other, well, two other meetings I got to go to was I got to go to a local woodworking club where right now it's a bunch of people meeting in a private garage. When I went, they had about 18 people showing off their projects. There was a teenager there and there were seniors there and there was everybody in between. And now they're outgrowing this private garage and looking for a place that they can go to share these skills and be in community with one another. And I also got to go to a meeting for the makerspace group here in Grand Prairie, which is for people trying, whether it's welding or 3D printing or woodworking or whatever other skills, they're looking for a place where they can collaborate and where they can teach. And both these needs strike me, both these groups strike me as important groups in our community in terms of passing on skills to youth in terms of giving our seniors, especially our senior men, a uh, place to stay engaged and stay social when they may need to give up their home hobby shop. And also we pride ourselves on being an entrepreneurial city and facility, things like this let people build prototypes and be innovative. And so those are two groups that I've got some ideas that I'm sure all of us do about some ways that maybe in the future, just maybe we could partner with them. And I hope that that's a conversation that council's open to having in the future because these are two groups that very much want to pay their own way and both times i met with them they talked about how they can generate significant revenue and how they could contribute at the same time i think they might need a little bit help to become sustainable so i'm hoping that's a conversation we get to have in the future thanks councilor pressy councilor thiessen uh, thank you, Mayor Given. I'm going to highlight a few things. It was uh, quite a busy week. Uh, I guess you could highlight it all, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, just, just to sort of begin with, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, partake in the Passionate Heart Awards. I know I was promoting it the last at the last event, but uh, it's always a pleasure to go there. Uh, you know, when you 
walk into a room and every person in that room cares about every human being in the world that they could possibly help. It's a great place to be on Valentine's Day. And I think it's romantic. But, uh, you know, I was single and alone. and But not alone because there's like 200 people in the room. So that was great. I got to see uh, a couple awards handed out. Uh, one for the Exceptional Team Awards, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association uh, and their outreach team, as well as Sunrise House uh, for the Youth Shelter Team. Uh, also, uh, some council alumni. There was the Business uh, Passion Heart Business Award winner Justin Monroe uh, was was unable to be there in attendance, but I think Councillor O'Toole was doing all the uh, gifting away, so he sort of tucked it away. And oh, he's, yeah, okay, well maybe maybe I just didn't see it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'd like to also uh, just throw out a tip of the hat to uh, two wonderful ladies in our community who received the Chris Henderson Award for 10 years of plus service. Uh, and that's Carla and Charlene Ekstrom for their work at PACE uh, and uh, their work with other organizations through their job at PACE. Uh, they've done incredible uh, things. They've held conferences to help uh, you know youth that are suffering. They've trained our there are support workers out in the field, and they've trained people in dealing with sexual uh, and otherwise violence uh, in their lives and how to handle them and how to rehabilitate themselves as well. So it was really cool to see their valuable work uh, paid off, and uh, congratulations. Wherever you are, I think they were in Mexico at the time that they received the award, so they were toasting some margaritas on the screen for us. In the week following that, I felt like I was part of the Premier's press junket. Uh, I did uh, happen to take in the NDP uh, nomination race. I think Councillor O'Toole was there, and Councillor Eunice Friesen was there in spirit as one of the nominating people for one of the, the nominators. So just a congratulations to Todd Russell, uh, who we gave him the go, the green light, at our last meeting to uh, do this run. And then if he doesn't win, he can come back to the fire department. But uh, definitely a good representative for our community. Anytime you can nominate a fire captain, you know you got a real person there that's uh, in it for the best interests of the people. So I was happy to see that. Uh, one of our community members, Jared Gossin, who was doing the nomination, in fact, uh, he was there to speak on behalf of Melissa Byers, I think, for HIV North. But he said to both of the people that if it wasn't for either of them, uh, he might not be here and that they both saved their lives. So that was his life. So that was kind of touching to see that, uh, you know, two people in one room who were fighting for the same spot uh, helped to save a human's life, which is always great. Of course, I took in the, uh, the Growing the North Conference and the nautical announcement, which is what I alluded to as being part of the Premier's press junket, all on council duties, of course. Uh, and finally, uh, this week... Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but I've been putting out some Facebook Lives. I'm uh, helping out with the Grand Prairie District Grief Support Association uh, in MC capacity. They somehow wrangled me into putting together a team to lip sync battle it out with eight other teams uh, for a great cause. Uh, so if I haven't asked you for a charitable contribution to me making a fool out of myself, well, by the time this meeting's over, I'm going to ask you to make a charitable contribution to me, hopefully, not making a fool out of myself. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Gibbon. Uh, I, too, was at the Passionate Hearts Awards luncheon, and I won't go into any detail except to say that I'm, uh, I was very honoured to be there and very proud of all of those folks who uh, were recognised. Um, and uh, I'll also mention the Growing uh, the North Conference. Uh, it was a real honour to be able to bring greetings from the city um, to, to the delegates at that conference. And uh, one of the things that I mentioned to them, and I will just mention again here, is that the success of the conference um, through those that attend and those that present add a lot of credibility and prestige to our region. And those are things that are invaluable assets to us as we thrive and grow as a community and as a region. And so I'm, uh, I'm very thankful that the uh, organizers put together this conference and turned it into the very successful and significant event that it is. Um, uh, this afternoon, um, we had the opportunity to attend a luncheon with the, uh, the Urban Development Institute Grand Prairie Group, and I found it very useful to spend time um, talking over lunch with them about the challenges and the concerns that they have and and uh, to ask uh, 
uh, the city for his insights from time to time. And so I just wanted to say that I really value the meetings that we're able to have with these kinds of organizations um, because it helps me to grow uh, as a counselor and uh, it'll help uh, in the long run to be able to provide um, good service to the people in our community. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Platt. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, I'll highlight two events as well. Um, a lot of it's been around Growing the North, and, and I won't go into a bunch of detail on Growing the North, but I, I did, uh, um, I really enjoyed the, the Chief uh, Clarence Louis' uh, uh, presentation. Uh, he made fun of politicians a lot, which was, uh, you know, got a good, some good laughs in the room, but, but well-guided uh, things. But one of the quotes that he really left uh, resonated with me was the economic horse that pulls the social cart. He had said that, and I really thought that was a, a, a good way of looking at uh, some stuff, and it's kind of put some light on things for me. But it was a great conference, and the chamber did a great job again. Um, also, I, I did notice the you know the city and the county's economic development teams working really well. So I think if you weren't from Grand Prairie, you probably knew a lot about Grand Prairie by the time you left there. So that was the intent. Um, the other one is I had uh, opportunity to bring uh, greetings on behalf of Mayor Given for the Planet Fitness opening here in Grand Prairie, their first location in Alberta. Uh, getting about 1,700 people a day through already with the goal of having about 6,000 members. So it was, it was, a, it's actually, a, it wasn't what I was expecting when we were at uh, the ICSC conference a little while back. Uh, Planet Fitness was one of the, 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 the groups that they talked about how this was a big growth movement going across Canada and gyms were taking a lot of space. Um, I honestly was just not expecting that to be that nice. I, I was kind of thinking I would go in the change rooms and there'd be one stall, no showers, you know, kind of thing, but it was, it was actually very nice. And, uh, so it was interesting to me, and I've had a lot of conversations since that about uh, potentially East, uh, what we're doing with East Link in our gym. I mean, they're, they're, they're substantially lower and uh, $23 a month. You know, so it's pretty tough to compete with that. So it worries me, I guess, about some city facilities down the road. Um, about when you get this kind of these kind of companies coming into our space, of how we can even compete with them, or even if maybe we should. So it's kind of a neat thing. It was nice to talk to the, the CEO the, or the, the, the gentleman that was up for the company that was our CEO. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a good event. That's where we leave that. Thanks, Councillor Platt. Councillor Friesen. Uh, thank you, and I will actually pass my my uh, sheet is fairly bare, as I was mostly away for the last few weeks. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Uh, Councillor Clayton. Thanks, Mayor. Given most of the events I attended uh, were already mentioned, um, I will mention one though. However, that I went on a personal note to the AMA safety patrollers presentation um, as my son was getting an award, and uh, so it was a great event to see a bunch of grade fives and six uh, at the RCMP station, and and they gave them a tour, and and the police dog came in, and and it was a great opportunity for the kids to see that what the RCMP members are doing as well as for the children that are out there on the cold days keeping other kids safe. So it was a, a nice ceremony and uh, I appreciate uh, Shelly from AMA and the work that she's doing to keep these kids engaged in, in traffic safety. So thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Layton. Um, I'll just highlight uh, a couple of things. Um, maybe just to uh, maybe highlight the different scales of things that I do in terms of uh, meetings. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with a um, uh, developer who is active in the Grand Prairie area um, and was able to spend uh, a couple hours with them on Friday the 15th. I uh, was supported by a number of members of city administration looking to uh, identify opportunities uh, and innovations to be able to support them in becoming uh, more active and being sustainable within the Grand Prairie area. I uh, certainly appreciate administration support in that, uh, as well as Aquaterra, uh, who joined in as well. and, and uh, um, wanted to contrast that with what I did the next morning uh, on Saturday the 16th. Uh, I went and had a coffee with a resident who wants to find a way to uh, support a children's community service organization with developing, uh, doing some parks improvements. They want to be able to plant some trees and put some benches in. And so just it was kind of an interesting contrast during the day on a Friday afternoon, um, meeting with a developer talking about things in the multi-millions of dollars and some pretty complex challenges uh, that required a whole bunch of di different city departments and then on a Saturday morning a quiet cup of coffee with somebody who wanted to find a way for uh, the youth that she works with to make some improvements uh, you know and put in some sweat equity which I thought was pretty cool to sort of see that contrast um, and then uh, last week um, Thursday and Friday I was in Edmonton uh, I attended one day of AUMA board of directors meetings um, and one day of uh, the Minister's Opioid Emergency Response Commission meeting. 
things. Um, and then I was back home on Friday evening. And uh, with that, I think that's all the items that I wanted to highlight. Um, other than uh, the announcement which Councillor Thiessen may have mentioned with respect to uh, the support for uh, Nautical um, and the province's uh, $80 million um, support for that development, I just wanted to highlight the role that, that our region played in um, attracting that investment to our area. Um, there is a direct line between uh, Nautical's choosing to locate in the Peace Country and the partnership between the city, the county and the MD of Greenview for the tri-municipal industrial project. Uh, it turned out that uh, Nautical was ready to go sooner than the tri-municipal area was gonna be ready to go. But absolutely, um, our conversation, uh, the work together that we've done as municipalities uh, was something that attracted their attention to our region in the first place. And I think it's a good sign of what we can do when we work together. And it was great to see the province getting on board with that vision and finding a way to be able to support that $2 billion project in the Grand Prairie region. Um, and so I, I would have been remiss if I hadn't mentioned uh, that annou significant announcement as well. Um, but with that, uh, I think we'll call our meeting adjourned. <laughs>